Hi, this is Stacey. Welcome to the Service Design Show, and this is episode 212. Now, let's be honest. Most of us did not go to business school. We're design professionals, not MBAs. So even though we might be doing great work, when it comes to showing the actual impact, it often feels like we're speaking a different language than the rest of the business. But this doesn't mean we can't learn to talk the talk and bridge that gap to finally get the recognition we deserve. Today's guest is here to show us how. Hi, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's needed to design great services that resonate with people, push businesses forward, and honor our planet. We're joined today by Stacy Barr, a world-renowned expert in performance measurement. Now, I know what you're thinking. Measurement, exciting, but trust me, Stacy's got a way of making it not just interesting, but downright fascinating even for folks who despise spreadsheet. She's also a bit of a gearhead, surprising people with her deep love for motorcycles. Today, she's going to share her hard-won wisdom on how to quantify the often intangible value of design. So in today's episode, you are going to learn about the real struggles we face when trying to measure the impact of design and why it feels so darn hard sometimes. The conversations we need to have with our stakeholders if we want to start objectively measuring the impact of our work. How to talk about the value we create when we're part of a team effort and not just flying solo. The tricky question of attribution. How do we show design's contribution when so many other factors are at play? What counts as evidence? Do stories and anecdotes hold any weight or is it all about the numbers? A step-by-step -step approach to go from those big, abstract goals to concrete, measurable things that we can actually track how to start measuring impact on a systemic level. Because that's where service design really operates. What to do when we can't run those perfect controlled experiments, but still need solid results. And finally, how to deal with stakeholders who might not even know what they want to measure in the first place. One of my favorite parts in this conversation was when Stacy and I rolled up our sleeves and got into the nitty gritty of measurement. We took a real service, the Circle Community, and figured out how to measure something as seemingly intangible as a sense of belonging. It was a refreshing eye-opener. So whether you're already a data nerd or trying to stay away from spreadsheets as far as possible, I promise you that this conversation will change the way you think about articulating impact. All right, let's get this conversation rolling. I hope you're curious to hear what Stacy has to share with us today. Oh, and don't touch the dial because I'll be back at the end with some closing reflections on what I learned from this episode. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine, and you are listening to The Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Thank you, Mark. I'm really excited to have this conversation. You're not a um, quote unquote typical guest on the service design show. Uh, we'll get into your background in a second. Um, we're going to talk about uh, measuring performance, um, uh, qualifying, quantifying impact, a topic that every service design professional loves to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, the reason why we are here, maybe this is good to give some context. So um, I posted something on LinkedIn a while ago, uh, and it was a small rant uh, where I uh, was kicking against uh, the notion of uh, key performance indicators visualized as a tree, as a hierarchy. 
and that we definitely should move into a web structure. And that post spiraled out of control and uh, through the uh, amazing internet algorithms, I eventually ended on a blog post about, uh, from you about POMP, a methodology, a framework that you've put in place. And now we're here to talk about performance measuring. So that, that sets uh, the context a little bit. Um, Stacy, for the people who haven't looked you up yet, could you give us a brief intro of what you do and what your field of expertise maybe is? Sure. For my entire career, which I guess is over 30 years now, my focus has been very specific on how to measure organizational performance, not people performance, not any other particular performance, but mostly the performance of an organization. So how its processes go, how it's achieving its strategy and that kind of thing. And the reason I kind of fell into that is uh, because I struggled with it in, in one of my first jobs back in the 1990s. Um, I was a measurement consultant because I was a statistician uh, and fairly, fairly good with people, they told me. Uh, I was just the right person to help the managers and leaders to figure out how they should be measuring what matters. And there was no methodology then. Uh, the balanced scorecard had just come out, but it really wasn't a how-to method. And so I really had to figure out how to overcome the struggles and the, the bumps in the road that people typically have when they're trying to get a measure they can trust that tells them how a part of their business is going. And I did um, manage to figure out different things and ended up piecing it all together and, and came up with this methodology called Pump that I've been using ever since. Uh, so that, that has really been uh, the focus of my work is to to find ways to to get pump out there to help all kinds of people in all kinds of sectors and industries to more easily and meaningfully measure the things that matter so that they have more feedback and influence over um, how those things go. Oh man, that, there's so much uh, to unpack in this conversation. And you mentioned measuring things that matter. I have a book here, I think, uh, that mentions what gets measured gets done. And um, we immediately can get into sort of the struggles of measurement within the space of service design where a lot of my colleagues and friends and people in the audience run up against. We feel that we are doing uh, work that's absolutely valuable, that's creating a lot of impact, that's helping organizations forward, but it's extremely hard to express in numbers. So. It doesn't get measured and therefore it's not valued. It doesn't get done. Uh, help us out. I think the, the beginning of, of, the, of a potential solution lies in the very words that you used, Mark, is that uh, we do things that aren't easy to measure, but the problem isn't actually where the measure is. Often we, we well, a lot of people, not just in service design, but all around the world, the, the, the question people ask is, I can't measure this. How do I measure this? And it's the wrong question. The right question uh, is to go back a little bit and to say, well, what is it, the impact that we're trying to have? The problem is that we're not articulating those clearly enough. And that's why we're not finding meaningful measures. So we'll ever we keep the impacts um, expressed in language that is um, intangible, broad, um, filled with possibility rather than specificity, all of those things get in the way of us finding measures that are meaningful. And the reason that that's the case, the reason that the words that we use to write our results really matter is because if we can't write a result that we can observe happening in reality and that everyone else could observe it the same way that we are, we won't ever have evidence that our impact exists or not. We won't ever have em uh, evidence that our, our service design work is doing anything at all. Mm. Um, it's the evidence that's the key to figuring out what we, we measure by quantifying it. So that's the starting point. It's how we write those results. The question here is, um, is evidence, ha does that always have to be um, expressed in numbers or are there other ways to present evidence? I think evidence never starts out, well, almost never starts out as numbers. Evidence starts out as a, a verbal description of something that we would see if, if we had a particular service design uh, goal that we were interested in achieving or, or result that we were interested in creating. 
we could see that result or evidence of that result. We could hear evidence about that result. We could touch evidence about that result. Less likely we'd smell it or taste it. But the point is that the only way we can observe evidence is through our senses, the senses that the human species has. Um, we don't immediately observe numbers. We, we, we observe things through our senses. And that's really uh, where we start. Now, once we've figured out what the observable evidence is of a particular service design result, then we can choose whether we quantify it or not. Or we can choose or, or, or um, decide whether it's worth quantifying it or not. So that evidence can stay qualitative, in other words. But we still may want to figure out how are there ways that we could set up a system to continually observe how much of this evidence there is, even if it is qualitative. And, and a, a qualitative result might just be happy customers, you know. We're not going to try and set up complex surveys. We're just going to look for cases where customers are happy or not happy or to what degree they're happy. But we we may um, decide in time that we, we might want to quantify something about um, the customer's experience. So uh, how often the customers contact us for help. Uh, that's relatively easy to quantify and it might be use useful to quantify. But the choice is ours. I mean, but we've got to start with what that evidence is before we um, can make that decision about quantifying or not. We in our uh, prep goal said maybe it's good to use an actual service example as uh, as a walkthrough to make things a bit more tangible. And we said, yeah, uh, the community that I host, the Circle Community for in-house service design professionals, I see that community as a service that I'm offering towards the community, and we are designing that. We are applying service design methodology. So I think. Uh, we can use that in our uh, in our conversation today to see how how I could benefit or how the community could benefit from being smarter about measurements. Um, so you mentioned uh, that there are many ways and we can, we use our senses to uh, find evidence. Um, in service design, we often deal with things related to experience. So whether that's customer experience, member experience, employee experience, and the data points that we collect are usually very qualitative. So like you said, happy customers, we could start collecting um, stories. How, like, what do members say about the experience in their community? Uh, Right, that that would be yeah. that, that is a very valid example, I think, for how service design collects data points about the impact that it's creating. That is a challenge, uh, and that is a challenge because that kind of data points aren't easily translated into spreadsheets and Excel. That's not data that an organization typically values or well values, right? Am I making sense here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it is a good starting point. Like collecting stories, collecting those qualitative stories is still useful information. The the thing about qualitative evidence or qualitative feedback, like the stories, is that they are more useful um, as, I guess, contextual or... Um, contextual data or data that, that gives us more depth and richness that should go along with numbers. But what the qualitative story type data can't give us is a really objective sense of how something is changing over time or how close or far away it is from what we ultimately might want. So generally, it's best to have a combination of the qualitative and the quantitative. Um, so for your your customers, you could absolutely, or members, I guess you could call them, um, you would absolutely have qualitative information, stories from them, things that they might say about 
describing their experience as part of your community. Um, and I think from, from our conversations, I know that uh, a sense of belonging is one of the things that's important to them. And that may or may not feature in the stories that they share with you. But if belonging is something that you've figured out is quite important, that enough people are mentioning it, or that it, it, you've already decided that belonging is, is part of the culture that you really want to create for your community, then we could dive in on that. So how could we track over time if the sense of belonging in your community is getting more or getting less or staying the same, or if it is responding to anything that you're specifically doing to try to increase that sense of belonging, we'd need to quantify it or find a way to quantify it to do that. So it would generally start with what does this sense of belonging really mean? Um, if it was happening, what would people see more of? What would they hear more of? And maybe we could start there. I mean, does anything come to yeah. your mind? So your question to me is like, what would people see if the sense of belonging goes up, right? I would yeah. say yeah. That's, a, that's a good question. Um, what would they see? Um, Whenever I struggle with a question like this, I uh, try to flip it around and like, what would be a what would be the lack of belonging? I think um, there would be a lack of trust. Completely valid thing to do. It yeah. Okay. No, like well, lack of trust, and then again, trust is a very uh, qualitative uh, measurement. Um, lack of belonging. People would care less. Again, qualitative. Um, and how would that express uh, maybe lower engagement, um, less frequent connections between members? Um, what else? Um, people not maybe promoting the community or not being presenting themselves as ambassadors of the community, things like that. Um, am I on the right track or am I just rambling here? You'll get, yeah. You're, you're demonstrating exactly how this should work, Mark, which it takes a little time to warm into. You've got to really unpack and explore and realize maybe for the first time you've never defined in your head what belonging actually is. We, we all have a sense of what it is and we know that it's important, but very rarely do we kind of really dig into what it means to us in the particular context that we're in. So you you were really getting there when you said I would start um, – uh, uh, after the trust bit, you were saying uh, uh, people would stop, um, w wouldn't be interacting as as, as often. Engagement. Yep. Uh, that is when, yeah. Well, engagement is is another thing that you can't observe either. You've got to understand what engagement is. But you got specific into something we could observe, which is people not interacting as much. That's observable. Engagement's not really observable. We don't know what we're looking for. We don't we're not, we don't know what we're looking uh, for an absence of. But people not interacting as much, absolutely. People not promoting it, people not telling other people about it. These are very specific things. So it does take a while to warm into that. But once we start getting into those observable things, and so far we've listed things we would see. We would see less interactions. We would see less uh, promotion of the community. But what could we hear if there wasn't enough belonging Okay, I'll answer that question, but there is another question on my mind. So what would we hear? Um, we would, in general, hear less. We wouldn't hear things like people saying, I feel at home, or these are my people, or yeah. um, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to uh, wait for the next uh, gathering. We wouldn't hear things like that. And so it goes. We, we we just keep exploring these things. Now, Mark, you and I have got very limited time to play with this, and, and especially the first time going through this kind of thinking about results and measures, uh, it, it takes a fair amount of time. But how we are doing this and how you are answering the questions is exactly the, the way we would continue to do it. The thing is we're getting closer to what becomes measurable. You can count how many interactions there are in your community potentially. You could count how many interactions there are per person. You could count how many members are not interacting frequently enough. You could count the time between interactions on average. There's a whole lot of ways that you could quantify that idea of people aren't interacting as much. And that 
is a nice, neat little example of how we start with something that we think, oh, how on earth would you measure it? And surveys, by the way, are not the answer to everything, as you've just realized. You don't just start a survey and ask people if they feel like they belong or not. It might be useful to do that as another piece of data because you could also collect more qualitative information about why don't you feel like you belong. But for the measurement side of it, we've now found a way to get the data that doesn't rely on a survey uh, that you've got right there possibly in in the way that your 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 um your membership platform mm-hmm. runs and and there you have it now the next question for me would be okay so we've somehow established that a sense of belonging is important to our business or our culture um Let's set aside for a moment why that is important. We can get into that, but okay, sense of belonging is important. And then we've drilled down to uh, some proxies uh, that we could observe, some things we could measure that we think influence a sense of belonging. I feel uh, a big trap or a big challenge or a big roadblock for a lot of service design professionals is that the question with regards to uh, cause and correlation and to attribution. Yeah. Can we dive a little bit deeper into that? Yeah, there's probably a few different parts to that particular challenge about attribution. In other words, I think you're looking for how can I uh, how can I know that um, that that what I've done has had an impact here? Is that Yes. Partly yeah. what you mean by attribution? Like yeah. So thinking... yeah, yeah. I, let me. Let, yeah. Fair point. Let me clarify. So let's say, um, in in our business uh, and the way we are designing the community, uh, we've established that we want to uh, do an initiative or start a project that is going to. Um, we hope it's going to increase a sense of belonging by uh, connecting someone who's onboarding to a uh, existing member to create a circle body. Um, we do that project, we start that uh, initiative, we do a prototype, and then we sort of need to find a way to connect those two things. Like having, does it actually contribute to a sense of belonging that you now have a circle body? So this is about testing whether an action designed to improve a result has actually improved the result, or even by how much did it improve the result? Uh-huh. Yes. And here our result is belonging, and the action is the circle body. Uh-huh. So uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, but you have to measure it. So this, if, if you want to actually know the size of the attribution, the size of the, the difference that your action has made, we have to measure, but not after we've done the action. We have to start the measuring before we've done the action. So we need to set up a way to, let's say we did decide that there were two measures of belonging that you you ended up choosing as being the most meaningful, but also relatively feasible for you to implement and get the data, okay? Because they're, they're two very important questions when we decide. We might, in, we, if we'd sat here long enough, we could have had 12 different potential measures for belonging. Um, we're not going to measure 12 things. We would have shortlisted them down to the ones that are the most relevant to you and the most feasible for you to to get the data and do something with. So let's pretend that you had two of them. One is um, the counting the average time between interactions in, in, in the circle. So across all members, what's the average time between interactions? Um, you might like it to be seven days, but maybe it was 21 days on average. You want to shrink that down because when you shrink that down, you sense that there's much more belonging because people are in there and, and connecting with each other more. That's one measure. The other measure could be, and I, I'm pretty sure you run some kind of a survey, a feedback um, survey with your members, and maybe there's a question on there on a scale of one to 10, to what degree do you feel like you belong here in the circle? So now you've got a semi-qualitative one because it's about feelings um, and you've got that quantitative one. And now you've decided, I want to have an impact on these because I can see that my um, average time between interactions is is too big and I'm only getting like a 5 out of 10 on average for, for people By the way, this is fake data. I'm just making it up. I don't know what the actual numbers are, Mark. Um, uh, So, yeah, an average of 5 out of 10 for how 
much people feel like they they belong in the community. Not good enough, you want to improve it. But you've got to know that first and you've got to be tracking that semi-regularly over time so that you have what we call a baseline. So the quantitative measures give us this baseline and then we decide when we're going to implement the circle buddies, how long we're going to test it for and whether we're going to do it. I think you mentioned maybe as a pilot. So maybe you were going to try it for some, maybe half at random half new members and leave the other half of the new members just without a circle buddy. Um, so that gives us two ways then to test the impact, uh, the before and after, which is you've got your two measures before, average 21 days, average five out of 10 rating. After you've implemented the circle buddies, I am, we might do that for three months, maybe six months. I don't know how long it takes for this sort of thing to shift. But over that time, we're tracking to see if those two measures are moving at all of, of looking at it is compare the data for those who got a circle buddy with those uh, new members who did not get a circle buddy and see if the, the measures are tracking differently for them. I would expect that, that you'd still get the 21 days on average and the five out of 10 for the non-circle buddy people if the circle buddy was a good idea. If you didn't get any changes, what does it tell you? This is so fascinating. Um, I see two practical challenges, day-to-day -day things, uh, again, our community runs into. One, very often there isn't a baseline in place. So the mm. organization isn't uh, capable or set up to measure the impact. People, uh, service design professionals are sort of thrown into an ambition, a mission, a vision, or working on a strategy without having any kind of baseline to see whether something is improving. So that's one. And that, that's, I would say that that is like, it's not an exception. That's, uh, that's the norm. The yeah. other thing is um, the way you described our prototype where we are having a sort of control group and a second group where we do the test, um, that sounds like an ideal scenario, but in reality, uh, I feel it's so hard to set that up. Yeah. Well, let's deal with that one first, because the easy answer is you don't have to. If mm. you can't do um, a, a controlled experiment where you've just got your pilot or prototype group um, and the rest, uh, you just rely on the other method, which is the before and after, which means you need the baseline. You cannot know the impact of something without that. You can't know that something's happened without evidence of it. So these are the two easiest you can get evidence of something. So as a service design professional, um, they may have already known this, but maybe what they haven't known is that it's okay for them to insist to their client that if their client really wants to know the impact, then putting the work into setting up the baseline is really important. We can't know something without information and, and the measures really are part of the information. Now, this is not a typical mark. This happens everywhere where um, I think most of the clients that we work with, they're looking for quick fixes. They're looking for the fastest, cheapest, easiest way to have an impact without realizing that there is some level of due diligence if we really want to know if we have an impact. And that culture is not going to change on its own, but people like us who understand it and who have to work within it, it's really up to us to find ways to get that message across to our clients that it's going to save them time and money and effort by at least establishing a baseline first. Um, now, it, it could be that the client has absolutely no data at all to establish a baseline, in which case it makes it a bit harder, but still not impossible. Um, but sometimes we can dig into the data that the clients have because something told them that, that service design was needed. Something told them that they needed this intervention. And we could start there and, and look for, you know, what told them that? Is, is there another KPI or measure that, that's been driving them nuts that we could use as part of the before or after um, impact assessment and and that data that KPI would very likely have data already to establish a baseline. The conversation has to start, 
and it's generally the service design professional or me and you know the people that I work with um, it's up to us to start that conversation and to give some guidance into how to into why it's important and and, and what the options are for for making it happen which there's no rabbits to pull out of hats here it's it's just got to be it's got to be done so maybe you can walk us through let's say i'm the client here what is the conversation we would have when i uh, bring you in and say we want to increase a sense of belonging and then where would we move from here first question might be what tells you that you need to why why do you feel that you need to increase a sense of belonging what's been what's been flying up in front of you telling you belonging has to be better let's say i would have a feasible answer to that one uh, what would be the next step well depending on what your answer is um, the next step could be a couple of different things if you say to me it's just a gut feel stacy i i just i've just got a sense that that there isn't enough belonging so okay that that's well and good is there any data that you've got and you say well no not really you know okay that's fine has anyone said anything to you? And you go, well, there was this one time that a member mentioned something and that kind of planted the seed in my mind. And then I guess I've kind of been paying attention to how many of our members come along to some of the the, the, the events or, or join the discussions that we have. And I don't know, it just doesn't look as much as it really should be. And already you're giving me clues about where we could start looking at measuring something to build that baseline and that's what i would i would say to you next is well okay if you really want to know how big this problem is and whether it's worth doing anything about it in the first place or to know how much we need to do to get it to move to where you want it we really do need that baseline we've got to figure out what the problem is properly before we figure out the best way to solve it or, or in fact whether or not it needs it is a problem to be solved so then we'd have the conversation kind of like we already have about how do you measure belonging um, and explore ways that are suitable for the client. So just because, Mark, we came up with two ways to measure belonging for your community, for the circle, it doesn't mean they would be the same too for any other client that was interested in belonging. The conversation is is the important part. Now, and that's what PUMP is actually. It's um, a series of techniques that are conversation guides they, they help us get to uh, a point where whatever the client says matters, we can turn it into something that is clear and specific and therefore measurable. And then by having that evidence conversation, we can then work out how we can um, come up with some potential measures that quantify it. And then from all of those potential measures, whether it's six or 12 or 15 or three, we've got a a way to talk about which ones are going to be the most suitable for the client. And they are involved in all of those decision points along the way. So they have complete ownership of it. And that also helps them have more um, commitment, I guess, to to establishing the baseline. They start seeing the power of having that information. Once you've got that baseline set up, you've also got the measures that are going to be used to evaluate how the service design intervention goes and the clients buy into that. So you, you've really not only set up the baseline, but you've set up a really good agreement with the client about what changes they're looking for and, and how to evaluate um, the actions that are taken to increase belonging. The good thing about what you shared here is a few things. One, there is a framework that you can follow. There is a process, there is a methodology. It's tested and tried, uh, so you don't have to invent this from scratch. That's awesome. The other thing that you mentioned is we need to do this in co-creation with our clients, with our stakeholders. Again, that's great because that's what we do anyway. That's what we're good at as a community, so that shouldn't be uh, any challenge. All, all benefits. I think this will uh, resonate a lot and it's just a matter of uh, testing, implementing it. Uh, a challenge that I do see is sometimes your client doesn't have the answer. So you're, you're working uh, with a quote unquote middle manager and they just have, they just got this OKR in this quarter to work on I don't know, whatever, uh, uh, improving employee experience, like that kind of vague thing. So their goal is vague yeah. as well. <laughs> How do we move from there? Oh, yeah, that's, um, there's two ways you can go from there, I think, or two ways that we tend to find we go. Um, like, 
OKRs can be done really well, but they can be done very poorly. And when they're done poorly, it's for the same reasons that any kind of goal is um, is, is not expressed very well. And generally, that's because of um, the, these vague words. Um, I call them weasel words. Uh, that was inspired by a book I read uh, called Death Sentence by an Australian author, actually, who wrote political speeches. Um, and he was really anti-weasel words. They're words like employee experience. They can mean many different things to different people in different contexts at different times. In other words, they don't mean anything to us right now. Um, so we have to dig deeper. So that's the first way. If we have a manager that's got a vague OKR and they say, look, I just need you to design something better, um, then the question is, well, what you're starting with here with this OKR, what's your best guess about what it really means about the employee experience from your experience as the manager, from your day-to-day uh, -day walk arounds and conversations and the depth of your experience as a, as a manager in your career, what's your best gut feel about what is the problem with employee experience right now? And really just get the manager to own some dimension of it. They may not want to. They may feel very apprehensive because they're worried about what their leaders are going are gonna to say. Uh, but it's a good place to start because very often um, it's respectful to the manager for a start because there is a lot they know um, about about their workplace and, and about their employees. So they, they probably would have a really good start. And if they don't, then it's absolutely okay to co-create something with them, to guide them or to um, to suggest doing a little uh, a little bit of a um, bit of not so much research as in fully fledged, well-designed research, but just a little bit of digging around. What say we talk to a dozen employees? Let's just pick them at random. And let's just have a quick conversation with them and just ask them a simple question. What is the thing about your experience in the workplace that most gets in, the, in your way of having a great productive day? And let's just use that data to try and figure out what employee experience could mean. And that's what we'll focus the service design on is, is fixing that because at least it's based on some evidence um, and we don't have to guess it. So that, that, that's two different ways to go with um, – with, with managers, and so many of them, like you say, starting with a very vague idea. It's mostly because they just haven't put the time or haven't had the time to just stop and think about it. And that's what we're inviting them to do, either by looking at their own experience and reflection or by just asking a, a small sample of their employees or whoever <laughs> the OKR is about. Yeah, there are so many things I want to ask you. I'm so happy that you are on this call. Uh, so, okay. Uh, We've so far described a situation around the community where we as service design professionals have the ownership maybe to go from understanding the project brief, uh, setting up a baseline, understanding what uh, success looks like and how it can be identified going through to implementation, implementing the circle bodies, then doing like uh, uh, a second study to actually see the before and after. This is not how most service design professionals operate. Very often, they are just a small cog in a much bigger system where, for instance, in this endeavor, they would be the ones maybe facilitating the process where a multidisciplinary team is thinking about how to improve the sense of belonging. And their role might be to facilitate again facilitate the process do some research research help to move the process forward how do we then in that case show improve our value our impact uh so is this more about how do you measure the impact of the facilitation approach of a service design professional yes to a sense maybe there is a more ge gener generic question there um the situation uh is the reality is that very often a service design professional isn't involved in the end-to-end -end process from setting up a baseline to actually implementing. They are part of that process, uh, part of a team who's driving an initiative forward. My, my first thought to that, Mark, is that it's always teams that achieve really important outcomes. It's, 
virtually never an individual working in a system of other people and complex processes that can say, I did this alone and this is my unique isolated impact and, and this this is what I contributed. <clears throat> it's always team. Um, and I guess it, it probably depends on the service design professional, whether it's – do they desperately need to validate their unique impact in something or as facilitators or whatever role they take, are they wanting to contribute whatever they can so the whole team can succeed? Um, I can't talk to the first one because it's not really where my work has taken me into understanding how to evaluate one person's impact or role or performance or contribution or anything like that. Um, and rather than just leaving that cold, I think it's important I explain why. And, and that's because I think as soon as we turn the spotlight on individuals and individuals' contribution, we're breaking down the energy of collaboration and starting to make it more individualistic and competitive. And I've only ever seen that drive dysfunctional behaviour, especially where measurement's concerned. Um, and it, it's, I have not seen it been done in a healthy way. So that, that's why I haven't got anything I can say to, to, to sort of guide that part of it. But if, it, if the service design professional has the, the other mindset about well, I'm a part of a team and it's the team that's working together and collaborating and it's our synergies and interactions and interdependencies that are going to make this a success. Uh, what can I contribute to the team that, that helps with that? And if, if they're taking a facilitative role and then they're, they're noticing that the team's not <laughs> taking an evidence-based approach and they're not measuring what would be very powerful to measure, then the service design professional as the facilitator can bring that idea in and also facilitate the conversations just like you and I have I've just had Mark so um, I my personal bent is that it's much more constructive for us to think about what are we collectively trying to to achieve in this interdependent synergistic complex system rather than trying to pretend that it's very linear and additive and compartmentalized and that we can kind of pull out a piece and say, yes, this is how big this piece is and this is the piece that I made. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's healthy. I, I like the other way of doing it. So I guess my answer to your question is I think if service design professionals feel that that's what they've got to do, uh, it might be worth reflecting on the benefits of that versus um, a more – collaborative interdependent kind of approach that's interesting and let's let's dive a little bit deeper into this because this is what i see happening there have been many uh, articles written recently on not specifically service design but design in general that it needs to prove its value and when design is part of like you said and collaborative effort it's really hard to isolate the contribution it's like for me, um, it makes much more sense to say I've contributed to a team that in enabled this specific outcome without being able to pinpoint what my contribution is. But the reality is, again, that we are seeing organizations and people in different roles who don't necessarily have a design background questioning and maybe just being curious about how much design is contributing to these efforts there is now now we're going to move away from quantitative stuff which is my field um into more of a qualitative approach to explore this i guess um and i'm not an expert in this approach i'm, I'm aware of it and i've been fascinated by it and i think it has potential to help in in this in this case but there's kind of uh, by the way it's called most significant change method but before we we talk about it um it could be I, I don't know how well service design professionals are explaining and positioning what design is about and why um it's useful to incorporate it into a project and i'm not a design professional so i don't know what that would look like i do think it's pretty important though that it's done that it's not you know we don't just join the team and 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 go with the flow that we really have to be upfront with everybody about what their expectations are that 
you know, wh why, why include a design professional in this? Um, but most significant change method is a very qualitative way of exploring the value of something. Not so much um, compared to anything else, but what what was the biggest, most significant change? So it, um, it it could mean that the service design professional is kind of gathering data, maybe partway through the project, maybe also at the end of the project, where they're asking a variety of stakeholders, uh, are, are you aware that design has been a part of this? And, and, and the stakeholders may go, yes, we're aware. From your perspective, what's the most significant change that design has made to this project? Now, I don't know if that's going to work, but it would certainly be a good way to start exploring it because I think one of the things it could also surface is when people aren't understanding what design is. And if they don't understand what design is, they're not going to be able to know if it's what it's – they just won't have the – the lens through which to look at the whole project and have a cl any clue at all about how it would be different if design wasn't there. So there is a bit of that education up front, but then the most significant change method could absolutely uh, identify a theme that kind of uh, converges toward uh, what everybody can agree is the most significant change of um, design. Now, the only example I could give you is where this was uh, used in um, African community, I think, where uh, they were trying to figure out the most significant change of <clears throat> taking investment and putting it into uh, that community so <clears throat> people could set up little small businesses and start improving their quality of life. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So how how this all unfolded over time was at the end of at the end of the program. I think they had a lot of the community sitting together under a tree, and the researchers were saying, "Well, what is the most significant change of this?" The conversation would go on, and 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 finally, it came down to one woman who said, "The most significant change is that I am here under this tree." And the researchers were like, well, "What do you mean by that?" And she said, "Before all of this happened." Um, I never had a voice in this community um, and neither did any of the women and now we do. Now we are here talking about our community and how we can make it better. That is the most significant change. So something like that I could imagine easily could come out of a design, uh, a, you know, a design professional's contribution to a broader project. I mean, Mark, I mean, can you, can you imagine what someone might say about the most significant change that a design design has made to a project? Well, I, I love this example. Uh, I can definitely uh, relate to what you shared, and I think it resonates with the work we do as a community and the values often expressed in these kinds of stories. So... Then we have a story like this, and we go back into our organization. And I'm going to sort of uh, uh, deliberately create a lot of contrast here. But uh, at some point, we meet somebody who needs to fill in an Excel sheet. And they're going to say, well, that's great that these people are under a tree. But how is that contributing to what we are trying to achieve? Like, where do I put in a number? Again, I'm I'm sort of trying to create a contrast, but that that is the tension that exists within our community. I still come back to the to to the the statement that we need qualitative and quantitative for sure. Uh, but if a service design professional really needs to prove what design has contributed to a project, they they can only go through the same process we went through for belonging. But it's not belonging; it's something else. What is the one, two, three? five most important impacts that design should make to this. Let's articulate them clearly and measurably. In other words, don't use weasel words. Be specific. Work out what the evidence of those things are, the pieces of evidence are. Agree them with the stakeholders in the project. Work out what the measures are to quantify them. Choose the best measures, again, with the stakeholders in the project so that there is um, buy-in uh, and ownership. 
and put the effort into collecting the data before you start mm. and collecting the data throughout the project and collecting the data after the project so that you can see that change over time. That is the most meaningful stuff that we could put into a spreadsheet to help us understand um, the impact that design has made uh, to a project. And yeah, it's going to take more time and effort and thinking. But it, again, there's no rabbit to pull out of a hat here. There is no shortcut or simple answer. If we want it to be meaningful, we've got to put the time in to having that conversation early, um, taking having the right conversations that lead to measures that people feel excited about, they feel ownership for, and that can have data collected for them throughout before, during, and after, <laughs> so that we can know um, how, how things changed as a consequence of the, the design. It, this is hard for everyone, Mark. This is hard for everyone. Um, it's not natural thinking. We're not taught this. No matter what kind of study we do to become the professionals we are today, we're not taught this. And that's partly why I'm so passionate about trying to get the message out is that there is a process, there is a way to do it. There is a logical series of steps that we can go through. Um, we just need to realize the value of going through them and find ways to make the time to go through them. And then, then we'll have all of these challenges answered. We'll, we'll, we'll be better design professionals because we'll have better feedback about yeah. the impact that we have. I think so as well. Uh, again, I'm extremely excited that you're here to share this with our community, to expose us to knowledge that's uh, already out there. Um, I'm going to throw another um, question at you that uh, I definitely struggle with, and uh, I'm going to guess a lot of my community members as well. We are often... Um, working on challenges that are quite holistic. So uh, we are a service is a very messy thing. Uh, it, it's experience driven. Um, we're not working on things that are quote unquote assembly line questions. There are a lot of moving parts. So we are working in systems and I don't know my math that well, but from what I understood, uh, it's impossible to optimize for a single piece in a system and optimize the entire system at the same time. So it's always a trade-off. Like you optimize either your specific KPI in this department at the cost of uh, sort of degrading maybe the entire service or you're compromising in your department knowing that this will lift the member experience or the sense of belonging across the board. Um, how do we go about maybe measuring these kind of systemic impact things? Yeah, let, I'll, I'll take a pause here. How do we go about that? I think step one is to understand them, understand the interdependency and, and the, the systemic nature of things. Um, one of the tools in Pump that we use is called a results map. Uh, we also call it a bubble diagram because really what it is, is imagine a page and there's a whole lot of circles on that page. Each circle has words inside of it and the words inside of it is a specific result like the community feels belonging um, or uh, everyone is using best practice service design approaches or members stay in the community. So each bubble has a specific result written in it. Uh, it's the same in a more complex organization where a particular service design is really trying to morph its way into this organic organizational system. Uh, and, and that service design could be affected by other things going on in other places in the organization. And it could, that service design could affect other things going on in other parts of the organization, not just the specific goals that the service design was um, elected to do. So this results map in Pump, this bubble diagram, uh, helps us kind of map out all of those things. Um, now, in an 
advanced organization, let's say, that's been using Pump for a long time, they will have a results map for the entire organization for all the results that matter. Uh, and what they'll be doing is saying, okay, we want this service design because we've got result A, B, and C here, and we want service design to improve these results. And by the way, these results have cause-effect relationships to these over here, and these results have conflict or um, what would you call it? Like a, yeah, a tension relationship with those results over there. So we can already tell you how this service design is likely to affect the organization and what we need you to keep in mind so that you don't optimize the service design and sabotage these other things so that what you're doing is making the service design optimize the whole. That's in an advanced organization that's already done all of that thinking and has the results map, the bubble diagram. How many are going to be like that? Not many. So often you're going into an organization where none of that thinking has been done, none of the systems mapping has been sorted out. So the best you can do is, is create a bubble diagram around um, the service design project. So you'd start with the results that the service design project is aimed at improving. You'd then start talking to stakeholders, uh, not just in the project team, but other stakeholders in and around. And, and sort of, you know, how does this service design project, if we, if we impact these results, how are those results can impact you? And they may say, oh, that'll benefit us. Yay. Okay, no problem there. Uh, but some other team may say, oh, hang on a sec. If you make that result better, it's going to put so much tension on our ability to do this. Like if you make that faster, that's going to put so much more pressure on us and we're likely to make a lot more mistakes. You're going to be pushing us too hard. Okay, so there's a conflict relationship there and we'd have to find a way to manage that. Um, so uh, those things can be mapped by the the whole team to kind of explore the, the systemic impacts around them. Is it going to be perfect? Of course it's not. Um, but it's at least getting everybody in the frame of mind where they're asking the right questions and they're looking for the synergies. They're looking for the um, the spin-off benefits. They're looking for the the tensions, as you say, Mark. So that that mapping is a great way to do it. And, and in the results map, the way we do that is we link the bubbles with different types of arrows to tell the story about that. So we've got a particular type of arrow for cause effect. We've got a typical, typical type of link or, or arrow for where it's a, a conflict or tension relationship uh, and, and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a great way to put on one page the best story you can based on the team's understanding of the systemic nature of the, um, the service designs. Um, morphing into the organization. The results map was actually the article that I first read and uh, learned about you. That's that's how, again, we're going back to the start of our conversation where I, where I sort of were, <laughs> was grappling with the notion of uh, a hier hierarchical yeah. objectives or goals perspective and that that's limiting actually the impact we can make and that we need to start thinking in a web or a network and well, I mean, see here a results map. But <clears throat> if we take something like a results map, which I think is a much more realistic representation of how systems, organizations operate, and we say, okay, we have an intervention to improve a specific result, um, isn't going it, like setting a benchmark and comparing that to a, a later stage, isn't that going to be close to impossible because there are so many other factors at play that influence the same outcomes that we are trying to achieve? It is impossible to nail that, to get that perfect. Uh, there, are, there are ways that systems thinkers uh, can navigate through that and and make uh, and help that understanding of the map map guide the decisions and choices that are made throughout, say, the service design project. Um, but most of us are not systems thinking experts. It takes a, a lot of work and experience to become that. So we can either bring them in if we want to, or we can just accept that uh, we're not going to be able to perfectly optimize a system. <clears throat> 
we're not going to be able to perfectly avoid any unintended consequence. But the fact that we're asking the question, the fact that we are keeping it top of mind, the fact that we've documented something that tells the best story based on our our current understanding about it means that we're going to be, uh, we're going to have heightened awareness, heightened attention for looking for those things should they come up. So if there was a conflict that came up that we had and anticipated, we'll see it and we'll be prepared to to work out what we could do about it rather than just kind of not even notice it or choose to ignore it um, and, and, and just let it let it become a, a little disaster. So it, it's it's really about the intention and the the practicing of um pa- of, of noticing these things, of realizing that they're there, of doing the best we can to create some kind of map that helps us better navigate through it, rather than just ignoring the whole system systemic thing. Um, but yeah, it no, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be um, it's not going to prevent every possible problem, but it's going to make us much more aware of them and, and in a much better position to nip them in the bud if we can. Again, I think this is going to resonate a lot with our audience here because it's super visual and it helps us to tell a story uh, about why our work matters and what we are trying to contribute to. Uh, I sort of think the the the, the thing we often trip over and that's what this entire conversation was about is how much and when i hear you speak uh trying to get to the how much is important but maybe not as important as being able to tell the story in the first place yes because we will never have better answers to the how much question unless we tell the story in the first place and tell the story clearly enough. Because the how much can only be derived from a well-told story of, of the things that matter and how they interact with each other. There's no point, in other words, of answering the question how much if we haven't got that clear story of all the results that matter and how they relate to each other from the from the starting point. That's sort of um, a relief. Uh and I, yeah, I think the the how much question is just as much as you said, uh, a work of collaboration, co-creation. Um, we can we can tell the story. We can come up with our best guess, but let's figure out together how much. And um, I think it's yeah. I think the reality is that we just don't know unless we have objective measurements, unless we have a measurement framework in place, unless we are doing multiple measurement cycles, if those things, like the answer is, I I will be able to tell you how much when we have these things in place. Until then, I can tell you, I can give you my best guess, right? And when a best guess works and that's enough, that's fine. but as you've also said from the beginning, um, clients are asking for the how much. They want the spreadsheet numbers. And what we've talked about are ways to put much more sensible stuff in that spreadsheet that that everyone feels some ownership for and trust in. And that really does make the whole thing better um, for, for everyone, maximizes everyone's learning for sure. I I'm not sure if you're going to ask me this, Mark, but it's in my mind right now, so I might as well say it. This this doesn't you don't we don't master this overnight right this is different thinking this is this doesn't come naturally to the vast majority of people so I think for service design professionals who've who've not spent a lot of time practicing and thinking about measurement start small and slow and be very compassionate <laughs> about with yourself um, it's much better to to give yourself permission to try and to learn from when the trying doesn't quite work out the way you expected. I mean, something like Pomp is there to give you the the, the, the guardrails, I guess, kind of the, to guide you and, and not let you fall too far away from what's useful. Um, but it does take practice over time and it's much better to start with something very small. Don't, don't go, oh, good idea. My next service design um, project, I'm going to go crazy and have – 12 results and and map it into a huge results map and I'm going to have 25 measures. I mean, it's it's too much to take on. It's much better to start small for um, the first attempt at doing this. So what would be, for instance, your tip for me when, again, we talked about a sense of belonging, 
how would I start small? Just by focusing on a sense of belonging and not any of the other things that that really matter in your community at the moment. I mean, I know that there are things that you're measuring already um, and you're getting some feedback and information to make better decisions from already. But something like belonging, if, if that if that turned out to be one of the things you just didn't feel like you had a good handle on, just pick that. Think that through. What are the very specific pieces of evidence that would convince you that belonging either wasn't enough or that it was getting better and better? Pick two, maybe three measures of that. We, we had two examples before, the average time between interactions and the average rating of how much people feel they belong. You might pick other things, but no more than three measures. And then go right ahead and, and get the data if you haven't got it already. Set up a data collection process if you haven't got it already. Um, start collecting it on a, a fairly regular basis. The survey one, probably not as regular as you can by looking at the data that your your uh, community platform might be able to collect for you. Uh, and just monitor it for a while. Don't make any decisions yet about how you might improve it. Just monitor that those two measures. Um, as you start getting a sense of where they're sitting at, start doing some investigations, start talking to some members about belonging and your data might be able to point to which members aren't feeling much belonging and, and talk to them about why not. And it'll point to people that are feeling a lot of belonging and talk to them about why. And then that will give you some ideas about actions you could take and then set up a couple of experiments and see if you can't make those two or three measures start to shift in the direction that you want them to. And then when you've done that, when you've learned from that, when you've become much more comfortable with that kind of measurement thinking, what next? What next might be not just one more thing, but maybe you'll try two things next time. One of them might be um, something to do with uh, the, the, the sharing or the implementation of best, best practice across the community. And another one might be um, retention, uh, member retention, and you might do those two things. So you kind of let it grow organically, but at a pace that you can comfortably cope with that doesn't burn you out that gets you to um to you know results that are worthwhile and useful for you that's practical advice and i'm definitely going to follow up on that i think i'm already am but this is I'm going to make it even more um uh, accessible um and i think this story is very accessible so that's a great part about this stacy uh, when someone uh, who's listening to our conversation got excited and would love to dive deeper into this, what is the best place to go to? I actually think that there are a couple of links that I can give to you to share with our listeners. Uh, one about the results map and maybe one about kind of like a streamlined approach to how to do this kind of thinking from go to woe. Um, I'd probably send you those two uh, links to those two articles and that would be the first place I'd encourage people to go because um, we've talked about things that are probably new and different and um, maybe some people have been able to visualize what we've been talking about. Others might want something actually visual that they can they can put their eyes on and then get a feel for it. And I think if um, if there's some passion to learn more and some interest to learn more, uh, then... Um, I get, they could just reach out to me, I suppose, uh, and and uh, I can see if there are other ways to help them. Uh, I generally tend to work with large organisations, though, so not so much the you know smaller indiv in, you know, individual people. But if there was enough people that really wanted to learn more about this, um, maybe they could reach out to you, Mark, and if there's enough demand, we could create something little and appropriate. Measurement thinking for service design professionals. That would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That would be an interesting offering. Let's see if there's enough interest. Um, I'm definitely interested. So um, <laughs> our time for today uh, is up, Stacey. I want to uh, thank you for um, coming into our community, sharing what you've been doing. I think it's extremely helpful, extremely relevant. Uh, it's great to get exposed to things that are maybe on the fringes of what we do and uh, bringing in uh, at least shining a light on those unknown unknowns and then becoming aware that there are experts out there who we can reach out to uh, if we get stuck. So once again, thank you for coming on and sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Oh, uh, my, my pleasure. I, I'm just so passionate about um, helping people uh, get, well, we talked about this earlier, Mark, about the truth, like 
I'm passionate about getting as close to the truth as I can because I think when we do, we make much better decisions and we make the world a better place. And that is what your community is all about, is improving um, improving the human experience. So I think measurement is a fundamental part of being able to do that. So I, I'm, I'm just so honoured to have had the chance to... Um, to share that with you all. And that almost wraps up our conversation with Stacy. You know, what really struck me was how much this all comes back to good design principles. We're talking about visualizing complex systems, co-creating with stakeholders and telling compelling stories. That's what we do best. The great news is that there's already a framework out there to guide us. So. Let's roll up our sleeves and start measuring what truly matters. Check out the show notes for all the resources we mentioned and let me know what you think. What question would you have asked Stacy? Hit me up on LinkedIn and let's keep this conversation going. A huge thanks to Stacy for sharing her wisdom with us today. It's been a real pleasure and I'm already looking forward to the next time. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the algorithm, but to let me know whether we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.